Joe, we got a really interesting program today. We got a we got a studio fill here. We're we're really going to drill down on this uh, local 338 CVS issue, and I'm excited about all the people that we have here to join us. Bill, we're going to dig down deep into this issue. Of course, you live in New York City. You go to a CVS at one point or another. Uh, incredibly, workers over in the West Coast are unionized, but not a single worker here on the East Coast. Is is uh, has a, is covered by a contract, and that's so, one of the things we're going to find out yeah. about why that's that way. We have Joe Fatano, Secretary Treasurer of Local 338. Yomara Frankie, she's a Local 338 organizer, and we have CVS worker Adrian Cattle. Kate. Yes, yes. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, where we are in this in this uh, in this effort to get a contract from CVS, uh, the the largest pharmacy chain in the nation. Well, welcome to everybody. We're really happy to have you here. Uh, let's start at the beginning. So let's start with the organizing drive, Amira. Tell me, tell me the genesis of this, how it got off the ground, how it all got started. Well, I first met with Adrian. He called our office and was highly interested. Uh, we met, we had a three-hour meeting and spoke about all the dynamics of what's going on in his personal shop. He's been with the company for 15 years. Um, so there was there was plenty of, of of conversation about what's going on, what the workers want there, and from what it sounded like, all the workers were on the same page. So this is an important point. I'm going to jump in here because it was Adrian that ju that reached out to you because I, I think a lot of times the public at large who don't understand the way unions work. Uh, they think that sort of unions, there's this picture that unions kind of muscle their way into things. And the truth of the matter is, it's a worker in certain working conditions that reaches out and says, hey, I need representation. So, a Adrian, if I can jump to you for a second. Now, how, what made you pick, what made you pick Amira to call? Uh, you know, what, what was the uh, course of events that led to that? Well, me and a few more of my co-workers had major concerns with CVS as far as pay as far as health benefits and, and the latter, you know. So um, we all decided to start the union. I was just the contact point, you know. I decided to make all the contacts, find out that you, CVS was unionized in other states. New York wasn't one of them. So, you know, I decided to jump on the train and do what I have to do. And I'm glad that I did it because at least now we have union representation like a, our or co-workers on the West Coast. Unfortunately, we don't have a contract. And, and how did you know to call 338? Uh, well, you know, I reached out to a CVS in, in California. A worker answered, was very inquisitive about the union. She gave me the number. I called. They informed me that, unfortunately, I had to contact a local in, in our area, which I did, and eventually met up with Umira and Nelson, and they've been great you know, met Joe through them, and, and so far everything has been great. They're out there, we're organizing, we're participating, and we're going to make sure that this gets done, ultimately. So Joe, tell us a little bit about the role that you've been playing here. Uh, well, I've been working on the negotiations with our collector, our Director of Collective Bargaining, Mike Pascaretta. Um, look, the one thing I want to jump back to is what you said earlier. I think there is a misconception out in the country about how organizing starts and, and, and that, you know, sometimes workers are forced into organizing. Almost all the successful organizing drives that we have, workers initially reach out to us. As Adrian just said, they basically had a committee and came to us and said, we want a union. And that's that's how most successful organizing drives happen, and that's, what, that, that's exactly what happened here. Um, and now we're in the negotiation process. Look, this company, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, this company has held us up every step of the way. The workers clearly voted for a union. They took us to court. They, the, uh, they, they uh, tried to protest the vote. The workers won that. They won in court. They, 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 it's clear they want to be represented. These are workers who are from the community. They live in Flatbush. They work in Flatbush. They're from the community. And all we're asking for is... A, a contract, a contract that the company is willing to give out on the West Coast. So we entered negotiations about a year ago with this company. Um, and from the beginning, the workers and, and our demands at the table have been reasonable. Um, you know, we, we know what the contracts out on the West Coast say. Uh, we know that the contracts have X, Y, and Z in them. We're not seeking much more than that. Um, and yet this company is 
is has failed to move at all at the table. And when you say the West Coast, Joe, uh, you know specifically what cities are you talking about? I'm talking about California. I mean, the entire state. Now, the UFCW has uh, over 10,000 members throughout the country, a majority of whom are on the West Coast out in California. Um, they've had, uh, the company has had uh, an ongoing organizing uh, effort, uh, through, the UFCW's had an ongoing organizing effort with CBS out there and has successfully picked up hundreds of stores and represents hundreds of stores with thousands and thousands of workers and has contracts with I think seven locals out there. I mean it spreads the entire length of California and they can reach an agreement with several UFCW locals out there for a fair contract why can't they do the same thing for the workers in Brooklyn? Absolutely, and the reason I ask is because, you know, sometimes if you, right, Joe, if you compare it to, you know, Oklahoma, if you're talking about Tulsa, you say, oh, well, we can't give you that because there's a whole different standard of living. But when you're talking about California, you're talking about something that, a place that has parity with New York. So they're, we're talking apples to apples here, right? That's the point I wanted to make. Absolutely. San Diego, L.A., these are all places that have the same cost of living. They have the same... Uh, the same, almost the same customer base as far as who you know who's buying product. Look, there's a CVS on every street corner in New York. You can't you can't walk more than a block without bumping into a CVS. So the question really is, why why won't they give us a contract? Why won't they give Adrian and his colleagues this a fair contract that they're willing to work out on the West Coast? They're willing to work out for those thousands of workers. Why won't they give it to those? workers in Brooklyn who've made the decision that we need to do better, that we need representation because this company does not show us the respect and the dignity we deserve. It, and it, and they, they reached out, they made the decision to organize. They've fought through over a year and a half now of, you know, actually it's more than a year and a half, um, of, of actually battling the company Okay, every step of the way, throwing lawyers at them, throwing uh, you know, lawsuits uh, at them trying to deny them their right to organize. Well, they finally lost that and have given up. We're at the table now. And now they're just dragging their feet at the table. And it's, it's quite uh, disgusting for a union city like New York, where most of CVS shoppers are union members. They are people who come from the community. This is a union town. A lot of the folks working in the city are union members. These folks deserve that same dignity, that same respect, and they deserve a union contract. And if they're going to ask for union dollars, in other words, people shopping in their stores to come, you know, union members to shop in their stores, they should respect the workers' rights to, to, to form a union and the rights to have a contract. A agreed. Now, am I, let me just jump back to you a second. As the organizer, so you have to go out, right? Uh, I, I know not everybody out there understands how organizing works, but before you can even have an election, you have to get a certain percentage of signatures, correct? Absolutely. And what is that percentage? The percentage is 30 percent. Yeah, get 30 percent. That's just to have the election. because right. and, and the reason we, we still have to do it that way is because we, we never got card check way back when under Obama. But don't get me started on that. Don't say EFCA. It's one, it's, it's one of my pet peeves that Obama never gave his card check. Don't anyway, say EFCA. Anyway, anyway, going back to that. So how long did it take you to get that, that percentage? I We were able to collect 30% within a week? <laughs> within a week. So this is, and the reason I ask, right, Joe, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty clear mandate from the people that are working there because these are people that work all different shifts and all they're coming and going, so they're not always necessarily easy to catch up with, right, everybody? Right. days off and so forth. I mean, it, 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 the fact that Adrian was a great leader and he was able to communicate with his coworkers and connect us with each other, he, it, it was just simple. As long as you have a leader in a store or any any place that you're organizing that has the ambition to do so, then you're in you're in good hands. He's they're the, they're the eyes. They're they're the backbone of the company. They know where, who, what, when. So Adrian really made it very easy for me to to communicate with his coworkers, and and they were they came to me with open arms. They wanted it, and as as long as we have people who want it then it, it makes the job way easier. And so what we're talking about is we're talking about a point person here that has extremely good organizational skills and extremely good communication skills Absolutely. and is not a quote unquote union thug, right? <laughs> I, I love that one. That's, that's one of my favorites, union thug. But Okay, we, we've only got about a minute here before we have to go to a break. Uh, so Adrian, uh, tell me in, in, you know, in a few words, Okay, what was your initial what was your initial feeling, your initial response when you got through to your mirror? Well, my initial response was great, you know, because 
Um, the union tried to penetrate CVS for years. I remember way back when I first started with CVS, managers telling me that there's union folks, you know, out and about, don't talk to them and everything like that. But I'm a firm believer in the union. Matter of fact, this country, it was built on the backbone of unions, you know, and it's because that the unions are being destroyed these days that, you know, the, the middle class is disappearing. Okay, and, and on that note, which is a very important note, we're going to leave it there for just a second, but we're going to be back in just a few moments with more good talk right here on Labor Press's Blue Collar Buzz. Oh, right here at AM 970, The Answer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we're going to jump back in. I'm just giving you a chance for the break. I so put you guys back. I don't know. We're not really taking a break. That's oh, just that's okay. that's just the thing oh, we okay. have to do. Oh. <laughs> I might have to reset up this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give, give her a second to reset. She <laughs> thought we were right. Anything in particular you want to go over? <laughs> so let's uh, let's jump into uh, what Tish James, uh, her view, and that's discrimination. Just mention that, and you get your feedback on how you feel about that. Whether you think that's case or not. Okay. Adrian, how do you feel about that? As far as what? Um, at the, at the, you know, before we jump on mm -hmm. again, um, mm -hmm. at the rally, Tish James, the public advocate, right. she indicated that there was a tone of racism and sexism behind right. their unwillingness to come to an, right. an agreement. Why aren't the people in California black and female? Well, I, there are a mix out there. I mean, there's there's white, there's Latina, there's Latino, there's, there's black. I right. mean, it's, uh, yeah. right. it, it's a mix. So, uh, all right, so when we come back on, I'll, I'll, I'm going to say that, I, Joe, I know there's a question that you got that you want, and then you can jump in, all right? Adrian, right. You, you comfortable addressing that? I'm comfortable with anything. There you go. <laughs> all right. Are you set, Joey? I'm um, in my element right here. I'm going to start recording now. Okay. You ready? Five, four, three. Joe, you ready? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Five, four, three, two. And we're back with more good talk right here on Labor Press's Blue Collar Buzz, the program that tells the story of everyday workers, their struggles, and hopefully their victories. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that this 338 struggle is going to be a victory. Joe, now, I, I know you got, uh, you're itching to ask a question, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, I just want to get your, your feedback on uh, what you thought about uh, public advocate Tish James. When she looks at this, she says this is a case of discrimination. Because the... Uh, but the store that we're talking about, Bill, is on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn uh, between Cortelyu and Beverly. Uh, very, very highly populated people of color. Adrian, what do you think about that? Do you think uh, discrimination is playing into this? Well, uh, discrimination comes in many forms, you know, and facets. So it could be. I haven't personally in, encountered discrimination as far as color and everything in CVS. Because I get along great with people, people get along great with me. That's just my personality. But I see a discrimination pay, you know. I see a discrimination in region because if, they're have a con if they have a contract on the West Coast and we don't, why? Is it discriminatory? It could be. You know, I don't know the underlying factors of what's going on because I'm not sitting in the boardroom making decisions for CVS, but it could be. Well, you know, you asked the question earlier, Joe, you know, why why on the West Coast and why here? And I'm going to I'm going to offer a suggestion as an answer. I'm going to say greed because I think that their profit margins, although are just fine or just fine to billion dollars. Right. And that, which is fine even though their project even though their profit margins are fine on the West Coast, they're probably lower than they are on the East Coast because they're paying people higher wages. And you know how much is enough? It always comes back to corporate greed. And just on that, right? I I I got a couple of stats here yeah. that are, are pretty mind blowing, right? Okay, executive salaries over there, right? The Mr. Merlot. Okay, sounds like a fine wine. Mr. Merlot, the president and CEO, he rakes in twenty eight point nine million. All right, that, uh, that was in twenty fifteen. We don't know what he's making this year. Oh, he might have gotten some bonuses uh, since then. Yeah, my yeah. guess is he's making a little more. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's still behind Tom Rutledge over at Spectrum, making ninety eight million. <laughs> yeah, and, and who's the other guy making ninety three that we're that we're complaining about all the time? There's right. so many of them. There's so many of them, my boy. And Mr. Denton, he's the executive uh, VP and CFO. He's pulling in a paltry, a paltry six point nine 
nine million a year, and the list goes on and on. And if you look at executive salaries, they, they come to well over fifty-five million dollars a year. So it seems like if they can eke out uh, a survival on uh, six or nine or twenty-eight million dollars, that uh, it seems like it might be in keeping that the people who make all that profit for them make a little extra as well. You know that used to be the American way, right? Is business would make money and and actually take care of its workforce, and we're just seeing a complete turnaround nowadays. Um, you know, we're, again, we're talking about a company, I'll throw a couple more numbers out at you. So we're talking about a company that last year in 2017 made $6.6 .6 billion in profits. Ouch. That's up 24% over the previous year, by the way. So this is a company that is doing, as you said, just fine. And how long have they had unionized workers in California? Oh, they, they, they've had workers out there for years. I don't know the exact date, but they, they, they've they been working on, on the CVS stuff for over a decade. Oh, so it's uh, not putting them out of business. No, they're, <laughs> they're, they're growing at the same time. And, and, and there's, there's no way that anyone can look at us and say a company like CVS can't afford to do the right thing by its workers here in New York that it does out in California. The bottom line is this. This is a company with 6.6 .6 billion in profits. It's a company that's looking to buck purchase Aetna. This is a company that clearly, clearly can come to the table, provide paid time off to its workers, provide, provide guaranteed wage increases, and provide good quality uh, health care for its full-time workforce. Now let's go back to something you just said. You said they're preparing to buy, buy out Aetna? Uh, yeah, there's a proposal for $69 billion to acquire Aetna Health Insurance. So they've got $69 billion laying around in petty cash that they were going to pick up a health insurance company with. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, their CEO said when this merger is complete, the combined company will be well positioned to res reshape the consumer health care experience, putting people at the center of health care delivery to ensure that they have access to high quality, more affordable care uh, where, where they are and when they need it. Well, here's my question. If you don't make a living wage, how are you supposed to purchase health care from Aetna or anybody else for that matter? Well, that's my point exactly. You know, you went over the executive salaries and look, I don't I don't begrudge anyone for making a dollar. That's the American way. Yep. But the American way of the past was actually the work paying the workforce what it needs to pay its rent, take care of its family and actually provide them with health insurance. Now you have to buy into health insurance as a, as a worker in, in most of the country. And We've gone to the table and we've actually offered across the table a health plan that will be cheaper for the company and cheaper for the workers than what they currently are offered. That's better coverage and they have no interest in talking to us about it. This is not about, this is about preventing these workers from getting a good contract. And we're trying to work with this company and saying, look, you've got a contract out in California. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's see if we can't work with you guys and actually see how we can get this thing done. And you know, while they're at the table and they're, and they're bargaining, they're not making any progress on many of the significant issues. And, you know, the bottom line for us and the bottom line for the workers in Flatbush is we're not going away. And I think, you know, you, Joe was at the rally a few weeks ago um, and, you know, covering the rally. The, the truth is that was just the first step. We're not going away. These workers deserve better. They deserve a contract. They deserve health care and they deserve guaranteed wage increases, and they actually deserve paid time off. Um, you know, the part-timers in the store, all they receive is the New York City sick leave. Um, out in California, part-timers get the same paid time off as full-timers. You know, Myra, Adrian, talk more about that. What, what are conditions like now for CVS workers? What, what's the average pay? How much time off do we have? Do, do people have any kind of medical coverage? Well, um, you know, based on the state, the state on minimum wage, that's how a worker starts. And it also depends on your work experience, what position you get hired at. But to speak to my personal situation, you know, I haven't had a raise since 2015. Because CVS enacted a standard where at a certain point, at a certain position, you know, they, they redline you, quote, unquote, where you get what they call merit pay. Now, that merit pay is based on a customer's reviews. They walk into the store, your name is on the receipt, your employee number. You know, and that customer can basically call in if that cu customer have a grievance with you and they don't like the level of service that they receive, your merit pay is, is um, affected. You know, I remember my first merit pay being $80 after I, they took health care out of that and, 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 and insurance and taxes. It came down to $32.50, you know, and, and that first merit pay was after two years. So it all depends on the position. It all, also, all depends on 
the manager that's hiring you, you know, uh, it, a lot of factors are before uh, or within the parameters of what CVS do. And that's now, and that's difficult. That system that you're talking about, that merit pay based on the uh, based on the receipt, because I mean, I'm, I've been guilty of this myself. I mean, we're all busy. I've been to you know more than one store where they give you the receipt as you're leaving and saying and do me a favor when you when you get home please go online and go to www dot whatever store and and tell us about your service and I got to tell you not, I'll be honest nine out of ten times I don't take the time to do it well, exactly. what is that on, on exactly. the bottom of a receipt that's three exactly well, yes, yeah, yes, yeah yeah yes, yeah yes, exactly and then the, the the just to make a point you know you might ignore it. A lot of people that doesn't have an agreement to ignore it. But what about that customer that comes in and, and feels that, okay, they saw an item for a particular per price. You know, that item may be expensive. They come to me, listen, this item was at a particular price, you know, I, I noticed certain things and I go, well, you know, I can't do anything about that. That customer can then go home after purchasing several other items, see that number, call that number and then say hey listen the level of service adrian gave me was not great it was not good they could tell them whatever they want to you know so um i'm just glad that the union is here i'm glad that they're representing me i'm glad that they're representing my co-workers i love these guys you know and i know that these guys are going to stand up and make sure that me and my workers are not only represented but we get what we deserve. There you go. There you go. There's, there's a man that loves his union. <laughs> what, what does it look like people, what kind of health care can people afford right now at CVS? They can. I mean, out of out of 15 to 16, out of 15 to 16 of our members there, only two of them can afford medical. So what does that tell you? I mean, not anyone there could just afford medical. If two out of nine, out of 16 people could afford medical, there's a problem. Right. No, and just, and it, just, this is a company that is getting into the health insurance business. Right. And just to piggyback off of what Umira said, you know, fortunately for me, I'm one that can afford the insurance. But then, when you actually look at it and how it's structured, if I was to get hospitalized today, I would have to t pay $2,000 out of pocket costs before they even pay a dime. Right. You know, so can I really afford it? On paper? Maybe. Realistically? No. Yeah. It's unaffordable. End up with a lifetime of pills. Yeah, and, and that's what I was saying earlier. I mean, we offered them insurance across the table that would be cheaper to the company and cheaper weekly to each worker. But actually, when he goes to the hospital under the insurance we offered, it'd be $100. Wow. So and that's the difference. We're, we're not no talking deductible. so much about financials as we're talking about struggle here. So let's leave it on that note for a second, and we will be back in just a few moments to talk some more about this right here on AM 970, The Answer. Right. Take a breath. <laughs> All right, so we're going to roll into the last segment. All right, last so segment. now, if so, if there's key, so this is the last segment we're going to do, right? So if there's key points that you guys want to make, yeah. this, is the, this is the time to bring them up, right? Okay. And at a certain point, like a, like a minute to go, to end, I'm going to throw it back to Bill, and he's going to do his uh, Spotlight on American History. <coughs> little, little history. We do that at the end of every show. Okay. okay. All right. All right. All right, so are we ready? Yeah, you ready? Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two. And we're back with more good talk right here on Labor Press's Blue Collar Buzz. I'm your host, Bill Holfeld, and my partner is with me as usual, producer and co-host, Joe Maniscalco. Joe, this is this is an incredible program we're having today. It's great to have everybody here around the table. We got we got all facets of the union, the, the worker, the organizer, the, the uh, you know the union rep. It's 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 all here. So Adrian was just talking about how he really can't afford the the, the healthcare coverage that he has. Uh, just reading the headline from this morning, Aetna order accuses CVS of improperly reporting generic prices to Medicare. Mm. So that there's a lawsuit against this giant corporation for ripping off the government. Yeah, and and Joe, I wanted to jump back for a second to something that you said in our last segment, which was. You know, how do you expect these people to pay? You know that the old the old style was you paid people, and what 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 came to my mind was Henry Ford. Now Henry Ford was no man of the people, right? But Absolutely. he was smart enough to understand I have to pay my workers enough money so they can buy my cars. And that's he used to say it all the time, <laughs> right? And that's the truth. And, yeah. and and I wasn't out of because 
we know, if you know anything about Henry Ford, he was about as close to an American fascist as you can possibly get. So he was no lover of the, the common man. But he knew that in a consumer-based society, if you don't give people enough disposable income, eventually you're going to run out of customers. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, and, and I, I mentioned it earlier because we, you know, look, it's no secret over the last 30 years what we've seen happen to uh, CEO salaries and worker salaries and the stagnation of worker salaries while the CEOs reap all the benefits. And, you know, CVS is just another example of corporate greed. I mean, I, I, John Durso said it earlier uh, while he had him on the phone. This, this is a perfect example of corporate greed. They know that the workers in Brooklyn have the right to join the union. They held them up in court trying to break them. Didn't work. They know the workers in, in Brooklyn deserve the right to have the same contract or a contract that is out on the West Coast that provides good quality health care, that provides paid time off for full-time and part-time workers. And when I see, pay, say paid time off, it's vacation, sick, personal time. Um, and guaranteed wage increases. Those are really the three big issues, right? Um, they know those workers are entitled to that. They know they can afford it. They are not willing to do it because it's going to affect their bottom line they're going to lose a little bit more of that profit margin, that $6.6 .6 billion. And, you know, I don't know what it would take it to if, the, if we organized every CVS in New York. What would it take it to, 6.5? 6. 6. Uh, um, you know, it, it, really, it really is a perfect example of corporate greed. You know, we've seen it over the last 20, 30 years. We've really seen it since the Reagan administration where, you know, corporations have started attacking workers. It started with the pensions, right? Used to be the third leg of the stool. You had your pension. Now... What they do, they introduce the 401k, cool. and, well, we're going to match what you put in. Which was supposed to be a supplement to your pension. Well, it was never supposed to replace it. Exactly. Well, it's going to be a little extra. Well, slowly they remove the pension, and they make you rely on the 401k with a match. Now we're at the point where most companies aren't matching. So now it's your money. So now it's you save your money. Now we're seeing the same exact attack that they, they took, the same exact att attack that happened on, on um, retirement benefits. We're seeing that on health care now. We're seeing that health care used to be part of your benefits package. When you went to work, you got a full-time job, you got health care. Now we're seeing, well, you got to pay into your health care. And slowly but surely, where it used to be you know, a very small amount, now it's more and more and more and more. And we're seeing a higher percentage, up to the limit of the ACA, which is 9.5% of somebody's salary. How, is, how are working class people who, you know, thankfully in New York, the minimum wage is going to $15. That's still not a living wage in New York City. If you live in New York City, $15, you're struggling to get by, even if you're working 40, 45 hours a week. The, the, you might be living, but you're not living large. <laughs> that's right. You, 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 know, you know, the idea, and look, none of us are ever going to get rich. I'm never going to be rich. Amira's never going to be rich. But the bottom line is you want to make enough to take care of your family and to actually have a little money on the weekends to take them to a movie, to go out and take them to dinner once in a while. That's, the, that's actually the American dream nowadays, right? The, but we've seen the same attack on health care. So health care is being attacked the same way they attack retirement benefits. And it's, it's a concerted effort from the other side. Believe me, corporate America knows exactly what it's doing. Um, it's, taken, it's taking its toll. It's actually impacting these workers where the plans are being downgraded so that you, know, you used to be able to go to the doctor and pay your copay. Now you've got a deductible. Now you've got a co-insurance coming out of your check every week. Now you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars. How are people who make $15, $16, $17 an hour, working 40, 45 hours, in some cases 50, 60 hours a week, supposed to make ends meet in New York City when they have to pay for their own retirement, pay for their own medical benefits, while the CEO pay just continues to skyrocket. And, and you know, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a little bit more philosophical question, if you will, because, I mean, every, all the points you just made are spot on, obviously. And all five of us at this table know that to be the truth. But sometimes I get a little concerned. We're almost like, we're almost like the DNC. You know, don't get me started on that one. But we're sitting in this bubble and, you know, and we're telling each other what we all know and what we all believe. And our, our real challenge, right, our real challenge is to get to the rest of the population who have, as you said, this has been going on for 30 years. So let's face it, a generation of people is 20 years. So we've got a generation and a half now of people that don't really understand the union movement, have misconceptions about the union movement, uh, don't understand just that it's your right to organize. This is, a, this is a right that you have. This isn't some huge privilege you're looking for. It's your right to be yeah, do represented. But, but we see Adrian, your, your guy, 
the guy who gets it, he's he's been the brunt of he's seen uh, corporate union busting. How many years did they try to dissuade you and say like I'm heavy into politics. I'm heavy into searching. You know, if if it's out there and uh, I'm ignorant to it, I will go out and I will find it. I need that information. I'm information driven. You know, and the thing about it is I believe in the capitalist system. I'm not against capitalism, but capitalism done right, where everyone gets a fair share. We're looking at a pie here when it comes to these companies, especially companies like CVS. The shareholders get the allotment of it. Then you get your CEO, your CEF, whoever else. And I'm at the lower end of the totem pole. And they're actually down here at the end of the totem pole fighting with me over scraps. I, I just don't understand it. You know, so capitalism, fine system. But let's make it work right. But let's make it work for everyone. Yeah, a amen, amen to that. Yeah. But, let, let, but let's go back to this a second. I really want to know it because, I mean, I think it's incumbent upon us. We're the true believers, right? Everybody at this table is the true believer. It's our job to make sure that, that other people outside of our little circle understand this stuff. Now, I mean, I get into conversations where, you know, I mean, we all, we all have some outside affiliation, uh, a school affiliation, a church affiliation, whatever it may be. And uh, I think without boring people and making them crazy, you don't, want to see, you don't want to get to that thing where their eyes glaze over, right? But we all have some kind of responsibility, don't we, to make sure that the people outside the union movement understand who we are and what we are and what we're trying to do? Right, and that's why I'm here. That's exactly why I'm here. You know, I encourage every CVS worker from east to the west, from north to the south, get in contact with the union. Make sure that you're heavily represented because the company's not going to represent you the way you want to be represented. You know, so get in contact with the union folks. I implore you, seek, search, and ye shall find. And, and Bill, let, let's let's be honest. There's people sitting out there saying, like, listen, I'm not going to join a union. They're they're all they all got their own gig going on. There. There's problems with the union. Of course, there's going to be problems with any kind of hum, human invention. You don't scrap it. You know, you try to fix it. You try to increase the democratization. That's my opinion. That's what needs to happen today. But you know, you but know you what? Definitely needs, you definitely can't win against a giant corporation on your own. But you know what usually happens to people like that? What happens when the company comes on, down on them now? You know, because ultimately that's what's hap what happens. When the greed starts spreading and it reaches your household, then when you're affected, that's when you come out. You know, I'm asking you to come out before it hits you. You know? Okay. So get involved. All right. And once more, we wind up on the same note, which is corporate greed. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. And we're going to throw it back over to Bill for your spotlight on American labor history. Thanks, Joe. Well, today's kind of special because uh, this the, the following that I'm going to read now is actually the original release from Associated Press from uh, April 23rd. And that's Grundy, Virginia, April 23rd, AP. Forty-five charred bodies were taken from the seared depths of the Keen Mountain Mine of the Red Jacket Coal Company today, victims of the volcano-like explosions which greeted the night shift as it entered the mine yesterday. The United States Bureau of Mines officials said no further bodies were in the drifts which extend far under the mountain. Members of mine rescue squads worked in 30-minute relays in the furnace-like atmosphere until they had explored every avenue of the big mine. Two members were overcome by bad air, which had to be blown out before the final group of bodies could be recovered. For many hours, the crews worked grimly without hope of finding life among the victims trapped by the blast, but unwilling to cease their efforts until every miner had been accounted for. A miner named Bill Smith, who had been riding with bodies down the four-mile narrow-gauge railroad for many hours, passed long enough to tell his eyewitness account of the disaster. He was standing 50 foot from the mouth of the mine when he heard the roar and saw the flame belch from the mountain. The blast was away from me and that's why I didn't get hurt, he said. I saw coal carrying cars, motors, slate and timbers spouted as if from a cannon. He didn't finish his story. Another load of bodies was ready to go down the incline to await identification by persons with tear-dimmed eyes.